Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Weekend Charts. Charlie Bilal here, and a huge show for you today. If you're watching this on YouTube, just take a quick moment, hit that subscribe button for more content just like it. We have a lot to talk about today. We're going to talk about the inflation report, the impact that that had on the Fed in terms of the expectations for a rate cut, the rotation heard around the world, huge shift in the market following that CPI report. The S&P 500 hitting more all-time highs this week, new milestones as well. I want to take a look back at the last 10 years with you and discuss the fundamental growth versus stock price growth in the S&P 500, kind of disentangling what has been a multiple expansion from fundamental earnings growth. Costco, uh, just one of the best performing stocks, obviously, in the last 30 years, hitting its highest valuation ever. So we'll take a look at that. Nike, on the other side, not doing so well of late, actually having its biggest drawdown since 2000. And we'll end, as, as we always do, with something positive. And that would be what I call the most important chart in an economy. All right, so let's talk about that inflation report. Down goes inflation is the headline. And for once, it wasn't just a lower rate of inflation. We actually saw an outright decline for the month of June Price is going down 0.1%. That was the biggest decline in prices that we've seen since May 2020 during COVID when prices briefly went down. But if we look at the year over year basis, obviously prices still going up, but they're just going up less. If we look at the headline number here, below 3%, this is the lowest headline number we've seen since March 2021. And below expectations, the consensus estimate was for a 3.1% increase, so better than expected. And the core number here, 3.3%, lowest since April 2021, and better than expected as well. The expectation was for 3.5% number. So what's the trend in core inflation? Lower, as you can see here, we peaked in September 2022 at 6.6%. And now we're down to 3.3%. And the expectation is this is going to continue in the coming months. And, and the next few slides, I'll show you why that's the case. But looking at the breakdown in terms of the major components here, you can see it's been a broad-based decline in the inflation rate. So it's not just one factor that's kind of bringing it down. It's most of the factors. So here I'm comparing the inflation report in June 2022, when CPI peaked at 9.1%, which was the highest inflation rate we've seen since the early 1980s, to the June 2024 number. And you can see I highlighted in green here in this box all of the components that are lower today than back then. And so with the ex exception of transportation, which is still a little bit higher, all of the other major components have a lower rate of inflation today than back then. And we can see things like used cars are actually going down year over year. Gas prices lower, a little bit lower than a year ago. New cars actually hold, starting to hold the line actually down a little bit over the last year. And the rest of these components just with a much lower rate than we saw back in June 2022. What's the biggest factor by far in terms of the inflation report? It would have to be that shelter number at over a third of the index and over 40 percent of core inflation is that shelter cpi number and the good news is it continues to trend lower you can see here it peaked at 8.2 percent that was the highest housing inflation we saw since the early 1980s and now we're down to 5.2 percent and month after month we have to discuss this gap between shelter CPI, which is a severely lagging indicator, and the real-time data, which is looking at real-time rental data from apartment list, actually showing a decline in rental prices over the last year. So the expectation is this is moving down with a lag, so we're going to continue to see lower rates of shelter CPI in the coming months, and that should help push down the, especially the core inflation, but likely overall inflation as well, assuming the other components don't move higher. And if we exclude shelter from the CPI and we kind of just get a look at everything else, we can see here for a while now, it's been around 2%, it's a little bit low, lower than 2% now, 1.8% over the last year. So if the Fed's obviously looking at this, Jerome Powell was talking about the shelter number recently and saying how he understands that's a lagging indicator so i don't think they have to wait until this number comes down even though it's the biggest component to come down to two percent uh, before they they start cutting rates i think they're going to be looking at 
the price index excluding that shelter because of that long lag in making their decision. So if we look at housing inflation, this is an interesting chart here, kind of showing you the divide between inflation for people who already own a home and inflation for people uh, that don't yet own a home, new home buyers. You can see the, a huge difference here. Shelter CPI overall is up 24%. So if you're just looking at, let's say, rents, or you're looking at home ownership costs in general over the past few years since the beginning of 2020, it's gone up by about a quarter, about 25%. But if you look at what it would cost you to get into the housing market today, big, big difference. And we're looking at a 99% increase in the median mortgage payment that you would need to buy the median priced home for sale. And why that huge disconnect? Well, two factors. Number one, obviously, being the mortgage rate being substantially higher, moving from 3% to 7%. And then you have the fact that home prices are still hitting record highs, about 50% higher than they were just a few years ago. So that factor leading to a big divide here. If you own a home, especially if you paid off your mortgage or you're locked into a low interest rate mortgage, the housing inflation hasn't been that much over the past few years. But if you're stretching, trying to get into the housing market now, that housing inflation number is really untenable. And if we look at other factors uh, of this home price appreciation boom, that I often talk about, a lot of people dismiss this, but now we're starting to see the impact of this. If you're living in your home and your home price goes up 40%, you're going to be paying higher costs in terms of insurance, in terms of taxes, in terms of maintenance. Inflation is hitting you in other ways as well. And we're seeing here a chart showing you the increase in homeowners in insurance rates over the past year and a half since the beginning of January uh, 2023, just enormous increases all around the country. I think the average is around 20%, but many states are seeing even higher than that. Interesting article from the Wall Street Journal said that in California, one of these insurance companies just got approved for a 20% increase, and they immediately applied for a 30% increase for the next year. So uh, what we're seeing here is insurance companies catching up with that huge, huge appreciation. Obviously, they've had a number of uh, natural disasters causing losses as well. But I think the biggest factor is simply prices are so much higher of these homes, it's costing more to insure it when you have to do a replacement, you have to do repairs, anything is costing way uh, more than it did a few years ago. So similar to car insurance and the increase we saw in car prices, we're seeing that now in terms of homes. And this is a re reflection, of course, also of the fact that these insurers have been losing money on uh, underwriting these policies. You can see they lost a record 16 billion in 2023. And the way they recoup those losses is going forward, they're charging higher rates. And if we look at the regulators, they're approving most of what these companies are asking for in terms of increases. All right, let's talk about the Fed and uh, the rate cut expectations. Huge, huge shift following that CPI report. Investors were already starting to move closer to that September hike, but it really became solidified uh, with that inflation data. And Powell also did a few speeches this week. And in one of them, he's talking about, in a Senate banking committee, he's talking about inflation is not the only risk that we face talking about how the labor market has cooled across many measures and how that labor market now is not a source of inflationary pressure so we talked about this last week that the fed has that dual mandate where it's looking at inflation and employment and for the past two years it's been really just focused on inflation because the employment market was so hot so tight doing so well uh, but now with that unemployment rate moving higher, moving up to 4.1%, with wage growth starting to cool, with the labor market loosening, that balance is starting to shift in the other direction. And clearly, the market is saying uh, that something has changed after that CPI report. We're now seeing a 94% implied probability of a September rate cut. So moving down at least 25 basis points at the September meeting. And what I always say in terms of the Fed is they do exactly what the market expects it to do. So if this is 
the the odds heading into that meeting the fed will indeed cut rates but i think at that july meeting which is coming up in a few weeks i think they'll really signal whether what they're going to do so if they're going to do that 25 basis point cut i think you'll probably uh, uh ma- they'll probably make it pretty clear at that july meeting that they're going to do that so what is the market expecting you know beyond that september meeting it seems like another cut at least another cut is priced in uh, before the end of the year, whether that happens in November or December, uh, we'll see. Uh, but f- for the year after, it's looking at four more cuts. So in 2025, four, four more rate cuts. So essentially looking at six cuts between now and the end of 2025. And again, beyond the next meeting, you can throw all the rest of it out because really any data point, any changes in the markets can change this dramatically. But this is what the market is expecting today and we've talked about how entering the year the market was expecting a number of cuts to to already have taken place uh, by this point and that got pushed back by the higher inflation data but now really the balance is shifting especially with that employment data that we got recently and now this cpi report which which is getting the fed more comfortable saying that inflation is going to go back to two percent now what would be the impact if the fed starts cutting rates well it's going to impact anything that has sensitivity to changes in interest rates number one would be things like credit card rates you can see here still near record highs 21 and a half percent so those with credit card balances obviously under increasing pressure are actually seeing the highest delinquency rate since 2011 Uh, So you're going to get some relief there. Of course, 25 basis point cut is not going to be huge, uh, but at least something moving in a lower direction. If we're looking at uh, new car loans here, we just hit the highest level for interest rates on new car loans since May 2001, 8.65%. So lower interest rates will likely bring that down as well. And what impact will this have on the car market, which has been uh, softening? Well, that certainly you would expect to see a little bit more demand. So a lot of people finance the cost of cars. I think over 80% of new cars are financed and a a high percentage of used cars as well. So what has been helping bring prices down, which is kind of was the goal for uh, this policy in terms of restrictive monetary policy, what has been helpful is these high interest rates. And so we'll see again, if the fed cuts rates if that'll start to change things it it all depends i think on how fast they cut rates and how much they bring them down 25 basis points is not going to make a huge difference so it's really what they follow that up with that initial cut so what else is the fed looking at in terms of rate cuts they likely won't admit to this ever but i think this is uh, definitely a factor in them choosing to cut rates uh, in september is the fact that this interest expense on our national debt is becoming more and more problematic we're now almost at 1.1 trillion another record high and we're adding debt at a rapid pace next week i'll probably be talking about 35 trillion in terms of the national debt we're getting very close to that milestone and so we have a higher debt balance and we've had higher interest rates here because of the Fed hikes and because of interest rates moving higher in the long end. And the combination of that is leading to this higher interest expense on the debt. And so far, we're simply borrowing more money to pay for this interest on the debt. Uh, But at a certain point, it becomes more problematic. So I think this is definitely a factor. Again, the Fed won't admit to it. They like to say that they're independent. uh, But I think the historical evidence has kind of shown otherwise. And Powell, if you go back to what he was saying in early 2021, he was very influential in saying that we should do a third round of stimulus. And he also said that that wouldn't have an impact on inflation. And boy, was that wrong. So I think he kind of is in the back of his mind saying, well, I I helped cause this problem. And so uh, wherever I could be helpful in terms of bringing interest rates down, I'm going to do so. So uh, we'll see what happens in terms of how much they end up cutting this year and over the next year. But I think this this chart here, regardless of what the Fed do, is going to continue to go up uh, because it's still not not one of the f- top few election issues that people are talking about. And finally, in terms of interest rate cuts and their impact, uh, the bond market is starting to move ahead here. And we saw this last year happen very quickly, and we're seeing it happen again here. 
last year when Powell made uh, those comments at the December meeting, uh, investors got very excited and the bond market had one of its best two month rallies in history. And now we're seeing another big surge here higher. The, uh, this is the aggregate bond ETF is now positive again, year to date it was down a few percent uh, just a, a month and a half, two months ago. And so turning into uh, a better year for the bond market, still not great, but certainly better. And if interest rates were to start really falling ahead of that September uh, meeting, you're going to see higher returns. And just highlighting this chart again that I put together of previous uh, Fed rate cutting cycles. And you can see here, this is looking at the Bloomberg US ag uh, bond market return here. And you're looking at better than average returns pretty much every time we've had a rate cutting cycle. So bond market tends to do well during rate cutting cycles. Uh, again, big question is how much the Fed ends up cutting, but historically it's been received as good news for the bond market. So regardless of what the Fed ends up doing, uh, you should make sure you're positioned well for the years to come in terms of your portfolio. And we can help with that at Creative Planning. I'll have a link in the show notes, uh, creativeplanning.com slash Charlie to get a free wealth path analysis. We'll, we'll take a look at your portfolio. We'll take a look at your uh, financial plan. We'll take a look at things like taxes, which are extremely important and help you make some strategic decisions uh, that will help improve your tax situation. And we'll also look at your estate plan. So do you all have all of your estate documents in order and what changes should you make there? So request your free wealth path analysis at creativeplanning.com slash Charlie. I'll have a link in the show notes and creative planning. We're in all 50 states. So you likely have a location right near you, 300 billion in assets under management and advisement. And we're here to help. So number three, I want to talk about the rotation heard around the world and it's very rare that you have a trading day like we had on Thursday of this week, just an unbelievable move in a number of different asset classes and really all of the secular trends that were persisting for really over a decade reverse course, at least for this one day. Well, will, will it continue or not? That remains to be seen, but for this one day, you just saw a remarkable uh, reversal and rotation in a number of different asset classes. And I've been talking about this uh, for weeks. So this is not a, a big shock in terms of what these uh, secular trends are. Number one would be the relationship between large caps and small caps with large caps, just simply dominating small caps, highest relative strength since 1999. The other big one being growth uh, to value ratio, highest since the peak of the dot-com bubble in March, 2000. And then there's other ones as well, U.S. versus international, obviously, and uh, things like the dollar outperforming currencies uh, pretty much around the world, especially the Japanese yen. And so a few days before uh, this uh, inflation report, I highlighted the returns in the S&P 500, really showing you the huge uh, differential between the biggest stocks in the index and uh, as you go down to the smallest stocks in the, in the index, what a huge differential we saw. We saw the 50 largest stocks up 13% on the year and the 50 smallest stocks in the S&P 500 are actually down 12%. And you can see a pretty strong relationship between size in terms of market cap and year-to-date performance. Now, what happened on July 11th after we got that inflation reading and, and after the expectation that lower interest rates are going to come at the, uh, in September via the Fed rate cut, what we saw is a reversal of all of these secular trends. So the losers became the winners. So things like regional banks, small caps, REITs, Japanese yen, long duration bonds, value stocks, emerging markets, international stocks, all positive on the day and the winners the previous winners all became losers so us dollar was down large cap stocks s p 500 was actually down on the day growth stocks down nasdaq 100 the enormous eight stocks apple amazon microsoft google netflix meta nvidia tesla all down on the day and semiconductors obviously the best industry of the last decade down as well and tech stocks in general down. So just a crazy, crazy 
multi-standard deviation event in terms of the spread uh, between a lot of these uh, relationships. And uh, what I did in a chart here is show you uh, the spread between uh, the Russell 2000 ETF, IWM, and the S&P 500 ETF. Uh, this is daily percentage moves. So taking the Russell 2000's return and subtracting the S&P 500's return for uh, da days going back to the start of this ETF, Russell 2000 ETF in May 2000. And you can see here a 4.5% spread. So small caps outperforming large caps by 4.5%. That was the second highest spread on record. Only October 10th, 2008 was higher. And this is a six standard devi deviation move. So just an enormous move. And it shows you, of course, that markets don't follow a normal distribution because a six standard deviation move mathematically should only occur uh, once every 1 billion years or so. And of course, we saw an even bigger move back in October 2008, a 10 sigma move, which really shouldn't happen ever in the history of the universe. But these things happen all the time in markets. And that's because markets don't follow a normal distribution. They have fat tails. And so we'll see these types of moves again, but still a remarkable, remarkable day. We don't usually see everything reversing uh, in terms of a single trading day, things that have been going on for years. So the big question, of course, is, is this the end? Is this going to, we're going to look back and say, this was the shift where small caps start to outperform, value stocks outperform, international stocks outperform. We only know the answer to that in hindsight, but certainly um, all of these things were stretched to the extreme. The rubber band was stretched and this was a snap back in the other direction. And, and as we always talk about, one day there will be a reversal and this is why you want to have things other than just a few big tech stocks especially at this point in time in your portfolio because we've seen it before and at a certain point we'll see it again where these things will underperform and other areas of the market will outperform so we'll check back of course uh next week and the weeks to come to see if this marked an important sea change for the market or is just one day and then we're back to normal where uh, the biggest U.S. large cap growth tech stocks really rule the day. Uh, but uh, what a story for that one day, at least for these other asset classes. And things can change in a hurry. So we'll see what happens in terms of momentum. It starts to shift. People can pile on. Uh, remember, the rate cut isn't coming until September. Will these trends continue? The story, the narrative behind it is that higher interest rates have been worse for smaller companies, and there's fundamental truth for that. It's definitely been worse for banks. It's been worse for REITs. It's been worse for things like housing-related stocks. So will these things start to see a boost if interest rates start to go down uh, heading into September and beyond? So that'll be very interesting and important to watch. Now, market in general, yeah, S&P was down a little bit on that day. Uh, as I'm recording this, it's snapped right back uh, on Friday here today. We'll see where it ends the day. But the S&P 500 has been hitting, you know, in recent days, an all-time high. Pretty much every single day, we had six days in a row with an all-time high, 37 so far this year. So, again, one of the strongest starts to a year in history. We hit another 100-point milestone for the S&P 500. You can see them piling up here, 5,600 Remember the top strategist prediction heading into the year was I think 5,400 so we're ahead now by over 200 points of the top strategist prediction entering the year. And if we look at the best starts, 18% now for the S&P 500 through 131 trading days in the last 25 years, only 2019 has a better return than this year. So just a remarkable uh, start to the year. And it's not just the advance that's been remarkable. It's done so with very, very low volatility. You can look at that in a number of different ways, but here I'm showing you the average VIX level this year, 13.8, well below the historical average VIX, 19 and a half. And this would be, if this holds, the least volatile year we've seen since 2017. If you remember 2017, that was pretty much one of the smoothest markets we've ever seen in history. The market was up, I think, every single month uh, that year. We had record low levels in terms of the volatility index. So it's not just that the S&P 500 is up so much in this short period of time. That's remarkable. It's done so with very little volatility. We had that brief correction 
around 6%, but the market rocketed right back to new all-time highs. I want to take a look here at the last 10 years comparing fundamentals to stock prices. So when the market's hitting all-time highs pretty much every day, it's up 18%. Uh, a lot of you have a lot of people saying a lot of different things so i want to disentangle kind of what has been fundamental growth over the last 10 years versus multiple expansion and this chart here really illustrates that the s p 500 sales per share are 58 percent higher than a decade ago earnings per share are 95 percent higher and the s p 500 index the price of the index is 188 percent higher so you can see here it's not just the case that fundamentals have improved the index has gone up well in excess of that so how does that happen well it's very simple investors are more optimistic today than they were 10 years ago so they're assigning a higher multiple on earnings and a higher multiple on sales we'll start with sales here you can see the s p 500's price to sales ratio as is getting closer to a record high here we're almost at 3x sales the record high was in 2021, late 2021, where we went a little bit above uh, three times sales. Uh, so you can see here, huge multiple expansion over the past uh, two years here, and uh, well above, almost double the historical median going back uh, to 2000. And if we look at earnings here, somewhat similar, we're at uh, 25.8 in terms of the S&P's uh, P ratio, looking at operating earnings. That's the highest also we've seen since 2021 and uh, well above, I think we're, we're about 40% now above the historical median. So uh, stock market is uh, trading more on the rich side. Is it at a record in terms of uh, P ratio? Not, not yet, uh, the CAPE ratio is approaching 2021 levels and still not as high as it was in 2000 but certainly moving to that end of the, the spectrum so what investors need to see of course as we're entering earnings season is we need to see a catch up here so there's a lot of expectations embedded in this index price increase which is saying investors are expecting earnings growth to be huge in the coming quarters and if that's not the case well then you have potential for disappointment because you have this multiple now well above the historical medians let's talk about multiples for costco here costco being one of america's uh best performing uh, companies over the last 30 years everyone loves costco i love costco uh, the stores are ab absolutely flooded uh, with customers and growth has been tremendous and all of that is true but i have to talk about valuation here because it's starting to get to somewhat extreme levels here for this type of company that doesn't tend to have high uh price to sales ratios because the margins are are pretty thin and if we look at crossco's price to sales ratio here 1.55 times sales about triple now the historical average stock of course going up a lot over the past year well above what its earnings and what its sales have done so similar story to what we were just saying about the s p 500 fundamentals have improved no doubt about it but the returns for the stock have far outpaced that so that means expectations are extremely high if we look at price to earnings here we're almost at 55 times earnings for costco about double the historical average and this would be the second highest for costco in company history only 1999 had a bigger multiple and costco again it's going to continue to do great uh, earnings are 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 definitely going up and to the right revenues are definitely going up and to the right the question is are investors getting too excited about that growth and paying too high a multiple and uh interesting thing here costco is hiking their membership fee for the first time uh since 2017 so it just shows you the huge demand that they're able to uh push through these membership increases and i don't suspect a five or a ten dollar increase is going to get anyone to cancel their costco membership so uh you have to disentangle in investing the concept of a great company versus a great stock costco has been in a, an awesome stock one of the best stocks in history but there is a point where you have to say is this price too high and you have to ask the question are we at that point today 
interesting parallel here because I was writing about Nike, similar situation to Costco a few years ago. And now you fast forward a few years and Nike's actually suffering its biggest drawdown since 2000, it's down 58% from its all time high. So I was writing about Nike a few years ago in 2021, hit a price to sales ratio, highest in history around six times sales. And what people were arguing back then, well, don't you see the growth rates? They're enormous, this is becoming a digital company they're going direct to consumer everything is transformative all that seemed to be true at the time but again when you're paying such a high multiple everything has to go right for the company otherwise you're susceptible or more susceptible to a price decline and that's exactly what's happened and why has that happened it's because growth slowed so you had that enormous boom uh, from the three stimulus uh, rounds a lot of that money went to consumer goods uh, sneaker sales just exploded higher apparel sales as well and since then we've seen that revert to the mean and we're actually seeing lower revenue growth over the past year for nike so we went from this just gangbusters record growth in 2021 to actually sales declining over the past year and and a lot of this is issues in china and they're seeing a, a pretty big slowdown there so just an important lesson when a price is high for a, a company in terms of its valuation, everything has to go right uh, for that company. Otherwise, it can be susceptible to decline. And it's kind of crazy with the market hitting all time high after all time high that you can have individual stocks like Nike down close to 60% from their high. So I want to end as we always do with something positive. This to me would be the most important chart in an economy, any economy, it doesn't matter where you are. What's the most important chart? Well, it's looking at the relationship between wages and inflation. And for two years, I had to report bad news about this because wages weren't keeping pace with inflation. They were well below the rate of inflation, but now we're in a different situation. We have been now for 14 straight months. So this is the 14th consecutive month where the inflation rate is lower than the increase in wages and this is good news for the economy this is the path to prosperity this is why people are feeling good about the economy by and large why they're still traveling spending money and uh, speaking of which i want to point to this travel chart that i like to look at looking at the number of u.s airline passengers on a daily basis and we just hit another record high crossing above 3 million travelers for the first time. So while consumers might be pulling back in terms of Nike and sneaker sales, their travel spending is definitely not. And I think this is the big reason why wages have been outpacing inflation. Hopefully this continues. So hopefully in my view, the Fed shouldn't be in any rush to cut interest rates. Even if they cut it 25 basis points, don't be in a rush to bring it down. You wanna make sure that wage growth stays above the rate of inflation. We definitely don't want to have a second surge higher in terms of the inflation rate. So with that, I'll end it right there. If you're watching this on YouTube, take a moment, hit that subscribe button. Have a great weekend, everyone. And I'll see you next time on the Week in Charts. Mm -hmm.